let me tell you how I got roped into this here. My agent called me last year and said, I have great news for you. I have a gig for you in February in Provo. And I'm like, Providenciales, Turks and Caicos, that rocks. I said, these Turks and Caicos, right? He said, kind of. <laughs> we talked about money. I'm not getting any. And then when he, you know, he broke it to me. He said, you've never been to Utah. You're going to love Utah. It's beautiful. So I said, OK, all right, all right. I, I've never been to this venue. What's the room like? And without missing a beat, he went, uh, Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I've been up here 10 seconds. I like this better than Las Vegas. I do. I do. I'm not kissing up. Vegas, too many neon lights. I think these electric fly strips are great. <laughs> never seen it before. It's awesome. <laughs> so my wife and I, I brought my wife. So we get to Utah, and we're staying in Salt Lake City. We go to the visitor center. What should we do? And I said, I don't want to wear myself out. I have a comedy special. These people are counting on me. <laughs> and he said, go take a walk and climb Ensign's Peak. <laughs> I said, well, that sounds high. He goes, no, this is the truth. This is the truth. He said, it's a mild hike. Like you wouldn't want to make it if you were in high heels. <laughs> Fast forward half an hour. I'm clinging to the side of a mountain. <laughs> wondering what kind of billy goats this guy dated that wore high heels. It's like this. It's deep. Hand over hand, because we, my wife, we got there. My wife said, "Let's get to the top quick so we can catch the sunset." Yeah, and it gives a better shot for the rescue planes to spot our bodies <laughs> and let our families know we didn't make it. And I remember it was right after I left my wife for dead. And I thought to myself, if I had a flare pistol, I would fire it into my pants to warm up. That's what I would do. I'm not kissing up. This is beautiful. This is, this is gorgeous country that was obviously settled in the spring. They got here, they looked around, they went, this is beautiful, this is God's country, let's put down roots, what could go wrong? <laughs> Six months later, they couldn't leave because their kids were frozen to the ground. <laughs> this was originally, I do a little research when I go to a place, I want to know a little bit about the place. This is originally the Timpanogos, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but I could, I could spell it. <laughs> Timpanogos. Indians, right? Native Americans, the uh, Timpanogos, it, which in the winter means I can't feel my teepee. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and if I could pay you a compliment, I think it is great, and I'm, I say this in sincerity, that you guys can go out and have a great time at Dry Bar. You don't need alcohol. Good for you. <laughs> I just came from Wisconsin. They have a drinking problem. <laughs> in churches in Ireland, they're praying for the people in Wisconsin to stop drinking. <laughs> I do one impression in all my career, and I'm going to do it for you now. What you're about to see only happens in Wisconsin. Give it a second. When it starts, you're like, no, we've seen that. We've been, no, <laughs> wait for it. Here we go. My one impression only happens in Wisconsin. You know why I pull you over? <laughs> you were weaving all over the road. You still are. It's the only state I've ever said to a cop, get in the back, I'll take you home. Get in the back.
<laughs> oh, I have two teenagers. I have a teenage boy. No, don't woo at me. If, you, if I say I have two teenagers and you go, woo, you don't have teenagers. I have a teenage boy, he's very smart. He was a, a National Merit Scholarship finalist. He's on full scholarship, University of Arizona Honors College. Doesn't have the common sense God gave a housefly. <laughs> on a summer day, I find him at the screen door trying to get outside. <laughs> have a teenage girl. And in this day and age, having a teenage girl has taught me that a teenage girl is the meanest creature on God's green earth. <laughs> Sometimes I just throw meat in a room and shut the door. <laughs> one time, one time I came home late at night, the house was dark, I opened the front door, I heard her bedroom door open, I peed, I peed. <laughs> She is terrifying. She doesn't sit anymore. She used to sit. She used to know how to sit in a chair. Now she flops all oh, like a murder victim. I feel like I should outline her body in chalk. And then when she gets, when she gets irritated, when she gets upset, which is two, three times a minute, she stands up, points her toe, puts her hand on her hip backwards like a fencer, like, hello. My name is Inigo Montoya. I hate my father. Prepare to die. And then she rolls her eyes back in her head until she can see her own brain. And she makes this sound. First time she did it, I'm like, are you decompressing? What's happening? If you come up too fast, you'll get the bends. What is going on? <laughs> and every time she does that, it irritates me, right? It's an irritating teenage thing. So I have to make a wise guy remark, which irritates her, because that's the level of my maturity. <laughs> right before I came, we were having an argument. We were, we were having an argument, because uh, I, I was breathing, and... <laughs> Totally my fault, totally my fault. <laughs> and she did her thing and, <sighs> and I went, you know what? I hope that's the demon leaving your body. <laughs> the good one, right? The good one. <laughs> She's mad at me. She's not talking to me, so it worked. <laughs> and if you think she gets me mad, you should see what she does to her mother. <laughs> I went to pick her up at her mother's house not too long ago, and I open the front door, and I hear the end of the argument. You know what I mean? The tail end, where my daughter is going at the top of her lungs. I hate you. And I hear her mother go, you know what? I hope I die on your birthday. <laughs> And I'm gonna have a card sent to you every year that says it's not all your fault. <laughs> That's when I left. I did not pick my daughter up that day. Now, I don't know if anybody warned you or let you know, but I'm the kind of comedian that likes to chat with the crowd. I like to talk with the crowd, but I'm not an insult comic. There was no reason for you to just look down right now like, oh no. <laughs> Nobody gets hurt. And it's really kind of cool, the reaction when you say, oh, I like to talk with the crowd, the reaction. There are some ladies in the second row who treat it like it's Jurassic Park. If I don't move, he can't see me. <laughs> I don't pick on anybody. I'll give out compliments. This is, this is a family right here. This is a, this is a beautiful family. What did you do to your hand? I was in a car accident. You were in a car accident? Yeah, the mailbox just jumped out of nowhere. The mailbox jumped out of nowhere? <laughs> If I were anywhere else in the country, I would have assumed alcohol. Do you know that? <laughs> I 
so if, if you don't mind my asking, you're young, young enough that I can ask. You're a young driver. You're a new driver? How new are you? Well, it was almost a week that I had my license. You had your license almost a week. <laughs> your parents let you go out on your own in winter in Provo. I don't think they like you. I don't think they like you. Have you been asked to sign an insurance policy recently? Has that happened? You should not have signed. Now, how long do you have to have the, the break? You have the, the, the like Velcro thing, like they attach, right? Like that's, that's much better than we had. They put us in concrete when I was growing up. <laughs> they did, and you know how they took it off? How'd they take it off? With a saw. I saw the doctor went I left mine on for three years. Three years I had my cash. They took it off in my sleep. That's what happened. <laughs> How are you, sir? You all right? How'd you meet her? At work. At work. What was that? What were you doing? Building gun safes. Building gun safes? <laughs> That's the sexiest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I got a line that could close dry bar, sir, right now. <laughs> so what was your job? What was your part of the gun safe? There's levels of complexity. If you were just the handle, that's different. But if you were the thing. I was in sales. You were in sales. OK, but you said building gun safes. But you were in sales. It was the manufacturing company. It was the manufacturing company of the, and you, you, how would you, like, what, what was your sales pitch for gun safes? You would go into their house when they weren't home, steal their guns? <laughs> and then knock on their door. Bet you wish you had a gun right now. <laughs> no, go check, I'll wait. <laughs> that would work, good for you. And what did you do for the gun safe company? I was in sales. You were in sales as well, you were both sales. Did you compete? Like, you, you know, quotas and contests and everything. And that built the tension between the two of you. <laughs> Some of you married couples, come on, you're gonna go home and play gun safe salesman tonight. You are, you are, you're married, that's fine. That's all right. <laughs> Sometimes I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So how did he finally ask you out? You're a very attractive woman. Sometimes that can be intimidating. How did he finally do it? Was it romantic? Did he put like a little card in a gun safe? And you open it up and it says, bang, I love you. Is that maybe? You were the aggressor. You let him know you broke up with your boyfriend so that he could ask you out. But men are pretty stupid, so you're like, I broke up <laughs> with my boyfriend. I'm single, and you're taking me to... <laughs> <laughs> you're a salesman, good for you. <laughs> what you didn't know was you set the tone for your entire married life. <laughs> with everything, she was always gonna talk to you as if you were stupid, sir. <laughs> Sometimes men are, sometimes they're not. But you set the bar right at stupid. <laughs> Which is kind of good in a way, because you can't do anything wrong. <laughs> That's a strategy, I like that. We're gonna have your arm surgically removed from her at the end of the show. You're on a date, that's okay, you're on a date. How did you meet her? She's lovely. Through work? What, did you hear him put the testosterone in his voice when he said that? <laughs> 18, right? They talked to you. So uh, what is work? How do you meet her? What do you do? You used to work in Chick-fil-A together until the incident? <laughs> you didn't start dating? until after you quit Chick-fil-A, because professional ethics dictated 
You don't, you don't want to be distracted on the fryer. That's not fair to the customers. <laughs> No, ma'am, I'll take that back. I'm sorry, I was distracted. I was flirting. I, no, you can't, I can't let you eat that, ma'am. It's very upstanding of you. You don't work together now, do you? No, you couldn't handle it anywhere if you can't handle it at Chick-fil-A. Imagine you were both air traffic controllers. That would be hard. It'd be irresponsible, don't you think so? <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Boy, are you upset that I'm moving left to right. Look at you. <laughs> He's just sitting there. I moved over to talk to them. He started going. <laughs> You're in good shape. Look at you. You're, you can't see. His nipples don't even point in the same direction. <laughs> you ever go to zip up your pants, accidentally rip them off? Does that happen? You, do you need to be in shape for what you do? What do you do? You work at a bank? As the safe? You're the most in shape teller I ever see in my life. Bank robbers come in, they're like, all right, it, never mind, never know that. Charlie, look at that guy, no. We'll go down the street, we'll rob a Chick-fil-A, come on. Getting older is a weird thing I'm experiencing right now. I am in middle age. I'm in my 40s now, and it's very, very strange. You know what's strange about it? Tell me if you don't think this is true. I feel like all the seniors now, all the grandparents, don't look as old <laughs> as grandparents. When we Remember when we were growing up? All the grandparents looked like they were on their last haircut. <laughs> The only thing my grandfather ever said to me was, <laughs> It's true, I would walk in, I'd be like, hello, Grandpa. <laughs> my mother's like, say something, say something. I'm like, <laughs> It's weird, it's very strange, like, like, <laughs> I was talking to a woman after a show, and I assumed she was around my age. Like, if you ask, is she, oh, yeah, she's around my age. That's what I thought. And I remembered I thought that when she brought up her great-grandchild. <laughs> and I felt a liver spot burst on the back of my hand. <laughs> my socks shot up to my knees, <laughs> and I wanted to watch the History Channel. Certain things I can accept about getting older, certain things I cannot. I, I, got, I got my first white hairs, 30 years old, perfect. That's not a midlife crisis, whatever. So I got white hair, I got white hair early, that, no big deal, right? I got, two weeks ago, I got my first white chest hair. <laughs> not okay. I went into denial, I'm like, maybe I'm part albino. Maybe I spill bleach on my nipple. I don't know. <laughs> Not good. Not good. And I think I'm a little more self-conscious about my age because, uh, congratulate me, I just got married in October. Yeah. Thank you. It's not gonna last. No, they say you marry your best friend, right? You marry your best friend? I did. I did. She's my best friend. As a matter of fact, two weeks before the wedding, I sat her down and said, you could do so much better. <laughs> She's my friend. She helps me with stuff. I don't mind admitting to you people, I suffer from a sex addiction. I do. She's helping me quit cold turkey. <laughs> I went to meet her mom. Her mom's a vegan. When we were dating, I went to meet her mom. You know, ve vegan. That's not vegetarian. Vegan, you can't even cook while a chicken is watching. <laughs> she hates that joke. 
don't say the thing about, I shouldn't do, her voice doesn't sound like that. Don't say the thing about the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> did I went to I went to meet her mom I never had vegan food before I was nervous first time I'm meeting her I remember you know then my you know my fiance opened the door and there was her mother milking almonds <laughs> which is weird because almonds is the cat <laughs> no 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 animal was hurt in the making of that joke. That never... But she made like this, this vegan feast to welcome me into the home. Like not, not a meal, appetizers, entrees, desserts, tables full of... And I'm meeting her for the first time. I ate everything. I ate for three and a half hours. Oh. And I remember I went and sat on the couch and went, oh, oh my God, am I hungry. 14 plates, 12 calories. What the heck just happened here? You think a vegan is meditating? No, they're passing out. Get help quickly. <laughs> I got in trouble too because she said to me, what do you drink in your tea? I don't drink tea, but I tried to bluff. I'm like, oh, I'm honey. Vegans don't believe in honey. They think the bees should unionize. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> she got all upset. They use smoke to calm the bees down. Did you know they use smoke to calm the bees down? I said, I did the same thing in college. <laughs> it wasn't at BYU. <laughs> so I told you about my teenage daughter. I want to tell you a little bit, a little bit more about my teenage son. When my son was a easy. <laughs> First, you learn to drive. You're lovely. He should be so lucky to date somebody like you. He should. He was, uh, when he was a year and a half old, my son was uh, diagnosed with classic autism. And a neurologist told me, Mr. Bronzy, because I, I wasn't accepting it, he said, you got to face it, your son is never going to talk. And he is, he's going to have to be institutionalized eventually. And we did not accept that. And he got what's called early intervention. Uh, when he was a year and a half, he started working harder than I'll ever work in my entire life. 24-7, uh, seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year with no breaks, he began to work to overcome his autism. Came all the way back on the spectrum till he was re-re-re-re-reclassified as Asperger's, high functioning. And the bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, the boy they said would never talk won't shut up. <laughs> You guys have been delightful. I'll leave you with this. I do believe in my heart that laughter is the music of the human soul. Thank you for the dance. Good night.